I introduced earlier that this is hip flexion. When we bring our knee towards our chest, that's hip flexion. The only hip flexor muscle we've talked about so far was the rectus femoris. You might remember which starts here and goes down to the tibia, the rectus femoris, the quadricep muscle. There are a few other hip flexor muscles, but the most powerful hip flexors of the body are known as the iliopsoas. These are two muscles that work together. They always work in tandem, really. Where are they? Well, visualize the onion again. If you were to really peel back all those layers of the onion, you'd get to your spine, right? You'd get to your core eventually. The psoas muscle starts at the 12th bottom rib and the lumbar vertebrae. These little wings, specifically on the lumbar vertebrae, that's where it attaches to, the lowest rib and the lumbar vertebrae. These wings of the lumbar, you can't really feel. They're called the transverse processes. Transverse process. That's a little different than what we're normal, than we, what we're familiar with. When we touch our spine, we actually are touching the spinous process. That's the, that's the back of our spine, but a little deeper in, we have the transverse process. They flare out to the side, and on both sides of your body, you have the psoas muscle starting there, hooking on to many different points, not just one spot. Already this tells us that the psoas is fairly large and strong, hooking on to those four or five segments. <clears throat> the psoas then will go down the body, crossing right over our hip bowl. This is our whole hip bowl here, and the psoas will cross right by it not even touching it exactly, and come into the lesser trochanter. If we remember again, the big bit was the greater trochanter. The psoas inserts there on the lesser trochanter. So it touches upon our thigh and our spine. But what it really affects the most is our hips and our lower back. This is a tough concept to grasp because it's hooking onto our spine so strongly, it exerts pull on our lower back. Because it crosses over our hip skeleton, it exerts movement at our hip bowl and all of the hip flexion and extension that we do. That's the psoas. The iliacus, iliacus is named because it's on the ilium. You might visualize this space here like big mouse ears. That's how I usually describe it. Large Mickey Mouse ears. The iliacus muscle is right in here. Let's say I took a piece of silly putty and threw it and had really good aim and I hit here. It would splatter inside this area known as the iliac fossa. The iliac fossa is where the iliacus muscle begins. So it comes to here, it comes down. And where do you think it goes? Well, same exact place as the psoas right there, the, the lesser trochanter. So since the psoas and the iliacus do the same job and they insert at the same point, most people combine the terms. Two muscles, they call it the iliopsoas. Psoas iliacus, iliopsoas. So as I said, most muscles have a main function and then they have other functions. These muscles are hip flexors. They lift our thigh. When, when do we lift our thigh up? When we walk, when we run, when we jog, when we run away from someone. <laughs> and that's a very important function of the iliopsoas, actually. So whenever we're using our iliopsoas to do these movements, we're doing hip flexion. And of all the hip flexor muscles in the body, of which there are about five or six strong ones, the iliopsoas is the strongest. So when we, when we are pulling our leg from this position into this position, creating a running or walking motion, the iliopsoas, more the psoas though, is initiating that action, which is a lot to say because it's such a strong core muscle and it initiates our gait and our running, it's working a lot. Now, a lot has been written about the iliopsoas. Um, one brief thing that we should understand about it 
is that our culture, our American or Western culture, promotes a hypertonic psoas. What do I mean by this? The way that we live our lives is promoting us to be excessively tight in this important psoas muscle. So tight, in fact, that many people have speculated that, that the tight psoas can cause imbalances in our mind, in our emotions. It can cause even possibly road rage. Why? Well, this is, this is, all, this is only a, um, a possibility, but let me try to go through it for you. If you have a fight or flight response, you get a certain reaction hormonally. You get your, an, an adrenaline rush, right? If somebody or something comes at you unexpectedly, you get this fight or flight response. You have to make a decision in a millisecond, right? All of a sudden your digestion shuts down, your senses are firing, you're right there in the moment. You feel a sense of danger. You have to run or fight, right? That's the fight or flight response. And a lot is happening in that millisecond in your body. Supposedly, the first muscle in your body that is innervated, innervation is the nerves firing up a muscle, the first muscle that gets innervated is your psoas. Because without it, you can't run. Or you can't run well or fast. So if you're running away from a ferocious dog or a person, your psoas has got to work, and it has to work quickly. So if, if it's working, it means that it's contracting. So here's where the idea comes from. Let's say that we have a hypertonic psoas, meaning that it's always contracted. Visualize that for a second. You're the type of person that for whatever reason, whether you're sitting at a desk all day or sitting in a car or a truck all day, or whatever the reason is, your psoas muscle on both sides is hypertonic and always getting this nerve impulse then subconsciously is a good possibility that your body is always sensing danger. That makes sense? It's kind of turning the fight or flight response upside down. Instead of saying that we're sensing danger and then your psoas contracts, people are saying, well, your psoas is always contracted. And so your body is always feeling a sense of anxiety. And that's a pretty, um, a pretty sad fact of life for a lot of people. So how would this exhibit itself? Well, possibly people who sit a lot, such as drivers, people who are always driving in a car, they often do have hypertonic psoas. Why? Well, they sit like this and like this. They're bringing their spine towards their thigh. They're always for maybe eight, 10 hours a day, shortening their psoas muscle. Their psoas muscle gets used to being short. It doesn't want to lengthen. Have you ever taken a long, long drive? Even if you're flexible, taking a long drive and then you get out of the car and you're, you can hardly stand up. A lot of times that's because of the hip flexors and the iliopsoas not wanting to lengthen. And that's for people who do yoga. But imagine someone who never stretches and sits like that. Their psoas is hypertonic, road rage can happen very quickly. They're already in a state of road rage to begin with.